Well, so I'm Doug Ord. Uh, I'm a professor at the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland. And I first got involved in oral history in 2001 when Sam Gustman came to give a talk at one of our professional conferences. And his pitch was that he had a collection unlike any that those of us that were working on searching speech had ever seen. Well, the basic problem in search is we have to figure out how to match up what you ask for with what you might want to find. So if you're searching documents, then we'd find the words in the document, we'd see which documents each word occurs in, and when you ask for a few words, we'd look for the documents that have those words. We do exactly the same thing when we're searching for speech. We try to find some spoken content. There aren't really spoken documents, but we'd find some spoken content. We try to find the words that you're looking for and try to bring you to those words. Well, the first project I know in which we used oral history was the Malak project. Um, that project started in 2001, um, was a five-year project supported by the National Science Foundation. That was a technology development project. So the goal wasn't to actually build systems that would serve searchers, but rather to build the technology that would figure out which words were being spoken and what was the best way of searching those words. See, the problem is that when you're trying to search text, you can tell what words are on the page. But when you're trying to search speech, you have to figure out which words got spoken. And so in that project, we worked with Johns Hopkins University, with the IBM T.J. Watson Research Center, uh, with two universities in the Czech Republic, uh, and with the uh, survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation, the name at the time. Um, and so we took this uh, unique content. It was unique because they had a very large number of speakers speaking all on the same topic. They had 26,000 people speaking in English uh, about the Holocaust. And so we could build systems that would learn from some of them. So from 800 of those speakers, we learned how they spoke. And then we could apply that to the remaining speakers and figure out uh, which words they were using at which time. A speech recognition system doesn't really know what words someone is using. It just tries to take some words it's memorized, it knows the pronunciation, and it tries to figure out where they're spoken. So if you say to me a word that nobody knows, I could get its meaning from context. A speech recognition system can't do that. It can only write down words that it knows exist. Well, one of the most interesting things to come out of the Malak project was that we were able to build systems that could transcribe speech with about uh, three words right out of every four. So um, if you tried to write down a sentence that was transcribed, it wouldn't come out very well unless it were a two or three word sentence. Uh, but if you had a typical 20-word sentence, it would be loaded with errors. It would be impossible to read. But it wouldn't be impossible to search because we would stumble across words that were useful for indexing, and we'd do that with great regularity. Okay, well, I should emphasize that this was a decade ago that we were doing this work. And at the time, if you wanted a speech recognition system that was tailored to work on oral history, that could get the kind of results that we were getting, what you would need to do is you would need to hire a group of people in white lab coats to stand behind some very large computer. I mean, if you think about the Watson computer um, that did so well in Jeopardy, um, that filled a room, uh, it's that sort of an operation. Um, it wasn't that you couldn't make this in a deployable system. We do this now. Um, we do this for news broadcasts quite routinely. We do it in multiple languages. Uh, it has uh, routine commercial applications. But uh, at the time, we had to build all of these things one off. And so having, having techniques that would allow you to try out different ideas was important. That process cost about a million dollars. Uh, that produced one speech recognition system that could work with one collection in one language. We also tried in that project to build speech recognition systems using a cheaper process, uh, using a process that could be applied to one language after another. It was all the same topic, uh, but it was many languages. 
Uh, so we did Czech, Slovak, Russian, and Polish, Hungarian. That same process could do one language but many different collections. And that turns out to be about $100,000 a throw. So if you come along with a collection of coal miners from Appalachia and you bring $100,000, we have a process. We know how to do this. Well, if we want to build oral history collections that will be searchable in the future, then what we want is we want collections that are amenable to the kinds of technology that we know how to build. So our systems can't recognize words they've never heard of before, but the person conducting the interview has heard the words before, and they can just tell us which words that might be unusual in general are occurring in this interview. Now that itself would help us define the interview because we have a set of good indexing terms, but then the speech recognition system can place those terms at the place where they actually occur in the interview. So we can use it as an index into the interview. So getting the interviewer to write down some of the most important terms, some of the most unusual terms that were spoken would be helpful. Another thing we could do, which we could do at the time we collect the interview, or we could do it later, is to transcribe just a part of the interview. So we build these systems by transcribing some interviews. But I have to transcribe interviews that are like the ones that I want to transcribe. That's why I have trouble doing British coal miners and Appalachian coal miners with the same system. So if I could transcribe a little bit of every interview, then what I could think of the system as being is a way of projecting the transcriber's actions out to the rest of the interview. So that's a second thing we could do. A third thing we could do, probably the most important, is to close mic the people who we interview. So if you look at how professional uh, television productions are done, people are close mic if you look at how we operate in normal life, we use what we call a far field microphone, a microphone that is at some distance, is picking up room acoustics. And that room acoustics is very, very hard to model accurately because we can't see the room in which this was done. And so we don't know its characteristics. We have to infer those characteristics. And we make mistakes when we do that. But if you close mic someone, you don't have those problems. So it's inconvenient to close mic someone. It might change the way they behave, but we need to start to think about how to develop microphones that will be perhaps highly directional, so get this effect, uh, or that will be unobtrusive. Um, and if we can then mic people closely, we do much, much better when we try to run speech recognition on it. Well, so there are really two different kinds of speech recognition applications. In one kind of a speech recognition application, I've got a pretty good idea what you're likely to say. And I'm just trying to figure out if you said it, right? So imagine that I, I live in New York. I call up Metro North to, to get a train schedule. Uh, it asks me what time I want to go. I'm probably unlikely to say Cleveland. But I might be very likely to say 2.30. So there's a limited number of things that I can say. It doesn't have to guess between very many things. And these things if we're lucky, sound very different. So it's an easy problem. But now, you take me into the realm of oral history where we could say anything. And now I've got to take the entire English language. I probably have to take words that aren't in the English language that people borrow and place into their speech. I have to take mispronounced words. I have to take words that are run together in ways that happen when people get excited when they're speaking. Uh, I have to take incomplete words. I have to take slang. I have to sort all of that out. So I don't have anywhere near the kind of context that you have when you're talking to one of these interactive voice response systems. When I talk to my GPS set, my GPS set knows where it is. And it knows what I can ask for. Right? And if I'm driving around in Washington, D.C., and it thinks that I asked for a town in California, it's not programmed very well. People don't do that very often, right? So it's got a limited range of things I can ask. This is how Siri works, um, this, uh, this new Apple product. 
um, it has some idea what I talk about because it can see all the things that are stored on my phone. It has some idea where I am because it knows what the GPS says right now, but it knows where I have been. And so it knows reasonably what I might ask about. It also knows some ways in which people ask things. So I don't have to ask things directly. I don't have to get it transcribed. I can get it to look as if it's interpreted because I have this extra level of mapping of how you say something to what you said. So it just knows a set of things that actually, they seem very complex, but the complexity is causing simplicity, right? Because of the complexity, we can tell which things are possible and which things are not, and that's what makes the speech work. And that's what's hard for us when we're doing oral history. So if you could just get the people that you're interviewing to limit themselves to, to maybe a hundred possible words, we could do quite well. I'll tell you the reason I'm interested in this. I actually am not specifically interested in oral history. Oral history is a way into the problem that I'm particularly interested in, which is almost all of the words in the world are spoken. They're not written, right? I probably write more than most people, and I speak a whole lot more than I write, and I hear a whole lot more than I speak. So most of our lives, are spent in a sea of spoken words. And these spoken words are, for large extents of them, ephemeral. Right? Once the spoken word has been spoken, it's gone. It lives only in our memory. Now that's not because we can't record it. I have in my pocket right now a recording device, a cell phone. You probably have one too. In fact, almost everyone on the planet has a recording device somewhere near them right now. Right? Four billion people could record their voice this instant if they wanted to. Almost none of them do that. It's not because we can't store it. Now, not everyone could store what they hear. It costs about $20 to store everything you hear for a year, right? All the audio you hear in a year costs about $20 of disk space to store. Well, there are easily a billion people on the planet that could store everything they hear for their entire life. Probably two or maybe even three billion people could do that. Maybe half the population of the planet could afford to do that. And yet we don't do it. Why not? Well because it would be useless. If I were to record everything I heard this year, the only possible way of making use of that would be to replay this year next year. But frankly, I'd rather live next year. And that's what everyone else thinks, and that's the reason why we don't do it. But yet we take pictures. Why do we take pictures and we don't record audio? Because we can find our pictures. Now, pictures are sometimes hard to organize and hard to find, but but we can do it. And if we couldn't, we wouldn't take pictures. Right? So, this is the key. Search is what causes collection and retention. If you can search, then you are incentivized to collect and retain. So, if you care about cultural heritage, then you care about searching speech.